Welcome to From His Heart with Pastor Jeff Shreve, who's in his new and timely series, The Church in the Last Days. Today, you'll discover the clues to look for in the inevitable rise and fall of the Antichrist. The year was 175 B.C. A man came to power in the Greek Empire, the Seleucid dynasty of the Greek Empire. He reigned for 11 years. He was famous for two things. Number one, he almost took over Egypt. And number two, he brutally attacked, persecuted terrorized, and murdered the Jews. He tried to eradicate Judaism from the land of Israel. History records that this man, his name was Antiochus IV, he came into the temple, that very, very sacred place where the holiness of God was. He came into the temple. He raided the temple of all its artifacts that were valuable, silver and gold and bronze, took all that, and then he erected an altar to Zeus in the temple, in the Holy of Holies. He sacrificed a pig on the altar. When the Jews responded in horror and rebelled against him, then he had many of them killed. He sold many more into slavery. He made it a crime punishable by death if parents circumcised their sons, as was commanded in Scripture for them to do. He made the Jews sacrifice to idols and eat the flesh of pigs, something abhorrent to a Jew, something that went against their laws that God had given them. He called himself Antiochus Epiphanes. Epiphany means the shining one. God manifest. The Jews called him Antiochus Epimenes, the crazy one, the madman. He was eventually defeated. He died from a disease, but the Maccabean revolt came against Antiochus, this one who fashioned himself to be God, God manifest. You know, the Bible speaks in Daniel's prophecy of this one. And and Antiochus Epiphanes serves as a foreshadowing of a ruler that is going to come, that is going to wreak havoc on the Jews and on the people of God. He has many names in Scripture. He's called the lawless one. He's called the son of perdition. He's called the man of sin. He's called the prince who is to come. He's called the beast in the book of the Revelation, but we know him best by the title, the Antichrist. The Antichrist is coming. John in the New Testament is the only writer of the New Testament that uses that term Antichrist, and he uses it four times in his writings. He says this in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, children... It is the last hour. We're living in the last days. John says it's the last hour. And just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have arisen from this we know that it is the last hour. Now the spirit of Antichrist has been around since Lucifer, the star of the morning, the most beautiful, powerful angel God ever made, since Lucifer became, uh, rebelled against God, and the star of the morning became Satan, the father of the night. That unleashed the spirit of Antichrist, because Lucifer, who became Satan, is anti-God. And his spirit has been 
working in this world and his demonic horde working in this world from the time of the fall to get people to disobey God, to disbelieve God, to distrust God, to go against God. Now, his plan has been at work. John, who wrote in the 90s AD, he said, hey, the spirit of Antichrist is here. We're seeing little Antichrists pop up, little false prophets and false teachers and things like that. But it's all going to culminate in one man who is going to be a lot like Antiochus Epiphanes, but he's going to be Antiochus Epiphanes on steroids. He's going to be a man that is evil personified because he's going to be Satan in the flesh. And the person that we know of in recent history, the most evil man perhaps who ever lived, Adolf Hitler. When the Antichrist comes on the scene, he's going to make Adolf Hitler look like a boy scout. Now, the Bible tells us a lot about this guy, this coming man of sin. Some people say, well, you know, you're going to talk today, Jeff. I saw the rise and the fall of the Antichrist. Well, why are you going to talk about the Antichrist? Because the Bible talks a lot about the Antichrist. There's about 100 passages in the Bible that are uh, dedicated to this guy, that tell us about this guy. Tell us about his rise. Tell us about his career. Tell us about his character. Tell us about his reign, his horrible reign. And they tell us about his destruction. And Paul, who wrote two letters to the Thessalonians, he talked to them at length about this coming guy. Now, the Thessalonians, as we've been studying this book, 2 Thessalonians, we've entitled this sermon series, The Church in the Last Days, Here's the thing that's really interesting about uh, the church at Thessalonica. Paul went there on a second missionary journey. He preached the gospel. It says he was there for three Sabbaths reasoning with the Jews and the Gentiles. And then it doesn't say that he was in the uh, synagogue anymore. And so we don't know how long he was in Thessalonica. We know that God used him to build a church there, and it was a great church. And the people had truly gotten saved, and the people were truly walking with the Lord, and they were growing But he was probably there no longer than six months, and the persecution broke out, and he had to leave. And so in this short period of time, he went from Thessalonica. He ends up on these journeys. He ends up in Corinth, and he writes them a letter called 1 Thessalonians. It is perhaps the very first letter, if you go on chronology, the very first letter in the New Testament. James might be uh, earlier by a year or two, but this is... 1 Thessalonians is about 50, 51 A.D. 2 Thessalonians comes just months after 1 Thessalonians, way before the Gospels were written. The Gospels were written in the 60s. And so this is one of the first letters, and it's a young church. And what does he talk to the young church about? Almost every chapter in 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians deals with the second coming of Jesus. He had taught these young believers, hey, the Lord is coming back again. You turned from idols. You put your faith and trust in Jesus and now wait for him to return because he's going to deliver us from the wrath that is to come. And we get so much theology from these letters in 1st, 2nd Thessalonians and 2nd Thessalonians concerning the second coming of Christ. And so this is what Paul says to them beginning in verse 1 of chapter 2. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus and our gathering together to him. You can put a a word right there and just put rapture. That's what he's talking about. The Lord is coming. We're going to be gathered together with him. He's coming in the clouds. He's going to call us up to be with him. He's going to take us to the Father's house. That's what he's talking about. And he says, verse 2, that you may not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Somebody had told these these young Christians that, hey, you missed it. Paul said that that, uh, the day of the Lord has already come uh, or that the rapture has already come and you're in the day of the Lord and God's pouring out his judgment and that's why life is so tough for you because you've missed the rapture. And they're like, man, they were all freaked out. They're like a, a John boat in a hurricane. And it's just like, oh, wait, wait, wait a minute. Paul told us that that wasn't going to happen that way. But now we got this other message, this letter, this spirit that said uh, that Paul changed his mind. And it's going to be different. And so you can imagine 
If you are taught that the Lord is coming back to, to rescue you from the wrath that is to come, and now all of a sudden you realize that that's not going to happen for you. You are in the judgment of God. You're in the day of the Lord. Well, they were freaked out. And Paul said to them, verse 3, Let no one in any way deceive you. For it will not come, the day of the Lord, unless the apostasy comes first, the falling away from the faith, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Or as some translations say, the son of perdition. Hey, if destruction and perdition had a son, it would be this man. Let no, uh, he says in verse 4, this one opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? Remember, we talked about this. Verse 6, and you know what restrains him until now so that in his time he may be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is the one whose coming is in accord with the activity, the workings of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders and with all the deceptions of wickedness for those who perish." Paul goes into detail about this coming man of sin, this Antichrist. And he didn't want them to be deceived, and he didn't want them to be forgetful. He said, don't you remember we talked about this stuff? So I want to share with you today three reminders from the Scripture of what the Bible says concerning the Antichrist. What does God want us to know about him? Obviously, he wants us to know some things. Because he gave us a lot of information about this coming man of sin. And remember this, for a believer in Jesus, prophecy is not given to scare you. It's given to prepare you. It's given to prepare you so you're right in your heart for the Lord to come and deliver you from the wrath that is to come. The things I'm going to share today, if you don't know Jesus as Savior and Lord, this is the future for you. And it's horrible beyond words, and God wants to use this to scare you so that you would be prepared, so that you would receive Christ and be ready for his return. So three reminders from Scripture. Number one, the Antichrist will be revealed after the rapture. After the rapture. Some people spend a lot of time trying to figure out who the Antichrist is. You can't know who the Antichrist is because he's going to be revealed after the Lord takes the church up in the clouds to be with him in the air. He takes his true believers out. Now, I think the Bible makes this very, very clear, beginning in verse 6. It says, you know what restrains him, the man of sin, so that in his time he may be revealed. He's not revealed yet. You don't know who he is because he's not revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. I mean, the devil is working and lawlessness is working, but he says, he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. If the devil had his way, he would reveal his superman, his antichrist. He would reveal him quickly. But the devil doesn't have his way. God is in charge of times and seasons and epics. The devil is not in charge of that. The devil can only do what God allows him to do. Well, you see that in the book of Job when uh, the the devil said, Lord, if you let me get at Job, I'm going to, he'll curse you to your face. And the Lord would let him have so much rope. So you can do this, but you don't touch his life. And then so he took everything from him. He took his children. He took his, his money. He took his, um, all his servants and his, his wealth. He took all those things, everything he could take. And then when Job didn't uh, turn on the Lord, the devil said, well, let me, let me attack his life. His skin for skin, all that a man has he'll give in, in exchange for his health. Let me attack his health. And God let him do that up to a point. But you can't take his life. So the devil only has what God gives him. And the devil doesn't know. He's waiting in the wings. He's like, when, when is God going to let me do this and bring my man to the forefront? Well, the Holy Spirit is the one resisting the man of lawlessness, resisting the devil. And when the 
Lord says, it's time. And he sends his son back in the clouds to take the true believers out. Then the restraint is removed. And then that lawless one will be revealed. He is revealed after the rapture. And so let's look at some characteristics about this guy. First of all, he will rise from obscurity. Daniel calls this coming prince, this man of sin, he calls him the little horn who makes great boasts. He's going to come from obscurity. He's, he's just a little horn. But all of a sudden, the little horn is going to take over. And it's just like the devil to do this because you get this in your head. The devil is a copycat. The devil sees what God does and he copies it. Antichrist is two Greek words, anti-Christos. Anti means against and it also means instead of, in the place of. So the Antichrist is against Christ, but he also presents himself instead of Christ. I am the one. You follow me. You worship me. And so the devil is constantly trying to come up with his own scenario that mimics the Lord. And so Jesus came from Nazareth. Nazareth, I mean, Nazareth is a grease spot on the road of Israel. It is a nothing place. And that's where Jesus came from. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Well, the little horn comes out of obscurity. And all of a sudden, he has this meteoric rise on the scene. Now, we got a taste of that in 2008 when Barack Obama, a seemingly unknown, all of a sudden just had this meteoric rise to the presidency. I mean, his resume was thin as a piece of paper, and all of a sudden it's just everybody's talking about him, and everybody's excited about him, and everybody's voting for him, so to speak. And the Barack Obama, don't get me wrong, he's not the Antichrist, but he, the Antichrist is going to have that kind of just bam, comes on the scene, and it's going to be, wow, we didn't, we didn't know this guy. I mean, he was just behind the scenes. All of a sudden, now he is the guy. He will rise from obscurity. Secondly, he will appear to bring peace and prosperity to the earth. So the tribulation period, that begins when the Antichrist signs a peace treaty with Israel. It lasts for seven years. At the beginning of the tribulation, we have the revealing of the Antichrist. This little horn comes to the forefront. And the Bible says of him, speaks of him in Revelation chapter 6, when Jesus begins, you know, he gets the scroll and he opens up the scroll and the scroll is a, is a book of seven seals, so to speak, is a scroll, so it's not a book like, like this, but it's, you would pop a seal and then you'd read some of the scroll. It's like a last will and testament. That's how they would do it. They would, they would seal the end with wax and you'd have to break those seals and then you'd read more of the scroll and then it'd break the seal some more and you read more. Well, it's, it's a scroll with seven seals. The first seal he breaks, it says this, Revelation 6, 1, and I saw when the lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as with a voice of thunder, come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. This is the first rider of the four horses of the apocalypse. The first rider is the Antichrist. And it sounds he's riding a white horse. And we said, well, Jesus rides a white horse in Revelation chapter 19. So maybe this is Jesus. No, this isn't the Christ. This is the Antichrist. He has a bow and no arrows. And what does he do? He conquers, but not through war. He's conquering through peace. The Antichrist is going to be some kind of smart and some kind of slick. And uh, he is going to be the uh, the top in terms of military intelligence, in terms of economic intelligence, in terms of political intelligence, in terms of tact and savvy. I mean, you sit down with him and you would think up is down and down is up. He is a deceiver deluxe. And so he is going to seem to bring peace to the earth and prosperity to the earth. And remember this, when the rapture comes, it disrupts everything. Because you have millions of people gone just like that. And so there would be major disruption. 
and major calamity on the earth. And so things would be falling apart all over the place. And uh, the Bible doesn't tell us how long you have between the rapture and the beginning of the tribulation. Some people think it's just bam, bam like that. But there could be six months, a year, maybe two years in between those events. But we know that in the confusion and in the chaos, there's going to be economic depression around the world and people are going to be hungry for someone who will lead them to success. Much like it was in Germany in the late 20s when Hitler came to power. There was economic downturn like crazy in Germany. There was inflation off the charts in Germany. They were looking for somebody to bring us up out of these uh, terrible times that we're in so that we wouldn't be the tail anymore, that we would be the head. Interesting quote by a man named Paul Henry Spake. This quote is attributed to him. He was the former Belgian prime minister and one of the principal architects of the European Union. He said this, We do not want another committee. We have too many already. What we want is a man of sufficient stature to hold the allegiance of all people and to lift us out of the economic morass into which we are sinking. Send us such a man, and be he God or devil, we will receive him. That is going to be the attitude of the world. That is, this guy has the answers. We're going to follow after him. And so he comes and appears to bring peace and prosperity to the earth. And additionally, he will appear to be Israel's savior and defender. The Jews are going to follow after him. They're going to say, hey, that's the long-awaited Messiah. You know, the Jews have been waiting because they missed Jesus. By and large, not every Jew, but by and large, the Jewish people, because they rejected Jesus, they've still been waiting for their Messiah. Well, the promises that they had, I mean, Jesus was here 2,000 years ago. So if you're a Jew and you didn't accept Jesus, then you got to think, man, when's this Messiah getting here? I mean, it's been a long time time. And so when the Antichrist comes on the scene and he seems to put everything back to normal and then he signs a peace treaty for Israel so that they can rebuild their temple, so that they are safe and secure from Arab attack, he protects them, he's their defender, they're going to say, that's our Messiah. It just seems to fit. Jesus said this in John chapter 5 verse 43, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another shall come in his own name, you will receive him. And they're going to receive him. And then we learn that he will be a counterfeit Christ with false signs and wonders and powers. That's what it says in verse 9. That is the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders and with all the deception of wickedness. Now, he's a counterfeit Christ. He is opposing Christ and places himself instead of Christ. He does the things that Jesus does and Jesus did. Jesus did power and signs and wonders. I mean, Jesus healed the sick, Jesus uh, raised the dead, Jesus fed the multitude, Jesus did all these things in the book of Acts, all sorts of miracles. All those miracles authenticated the message. They were true signs. They weren't false signs because they pointed people to the truth. The devil has power and he has signs and he has false lying wonders, not that necessarily that his wonders are all fake, but his wonders point to a lie. They point to falsehood. They, he does these things to get people to believe him who is a liar and the father of lies. Now, we know from Scripture that the devil can do things that are considered miraculous things. I mean, we saw that in the book of Exodus. God sent Moses and Aaron to Pharaoh, let my people go. I'm not going to let your God, I'm, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? I'm not letting uh, his people go. Moses, take your staff, throw it down. It becomes a serpent. Well, look at that. And Pharaoh had his Egyptians, his magicians, that they could make their staff turn into a serpent too. 
Moses, God had Moses turn the Nile into blood. Pharaoh's magicians could turn water into blood too. Moses was led by God to have frogs come up from the earth. Pharaoh's magicians could do that too. The devil has power to do all sorts of signs and wonders and lying miracles to lead people to falsehood. But now here's the greatest one that the devil will do through this person, the Antichrist, is he's going to give them a false resurrection, a lying resurrection. I mean, what is the core of Christianity? What is the cornerstone of Christianity? The cross, the death of Christ, and the resurrection of Christ. And this Antichrist is going to have a resurrection. This is what it says in Revelation chapter 13. And I saw one of his heads, speaking of the beast, that's the the designation that's given in Revelation for the Antichrist, the beast. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain and his fatal wound was healed. And the whole world was amazed and followed after the beast. And they worshiped the dragon. That's another name for Satan because he gave his authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast? And who is able to wage war with him? There's going to be something that happens to this guy somewhere in this first three and a half year period, the first part of the tribulation period, where it's going to look like he is assassinated. And everyone's going to see, well, he's dead. It's like JFK gets shot in the head. How do you survive getting shot in the head? You don't. You die as JFK died. This guy is going to take a direct shot, and everyone's going to think he's dead, and all of a sudden... He's going to rise from the dead, so to speak. Now, it says, Revelation 13, that it, a fatal wound as if he had a fatal wound that was healed. So I don't know if this is a real resurrection or a fake resurrection, but the world's going to believe it's real. And Revelation chapter 13, John says three times about the one whose fatal wound was healed. This is big time. And this is going to usher in the people following the beast and worshiping the beast because they say this guy conquered death. The Antichrist will be revealed after the rapture. Second reminder, the Antichrist will claim to be God and demand to be worshiped. He's going to claim to be God. He's going to demand to be worshiped. Verse 3, let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. So the Bible tells us this, very key verse, Daniel 9, 27. That lays out the tribulation period. That's where we come up with seven years of tribulation. Daniel 9 says this, and he, speaking of this prince who is to come, speaking of this man of sin, he will make a firm covenant with the many, meaning Israel, with Israel for one week. Not a week of days, a week of years, for seven years. But in the middle of the week, at the three and a half year mark, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Jesus talked about this in Matthew chapter 24 on his Olivet Discourse. He talked about the abomination of desolation. The abomination of desolation is when the man of sin... The lawless one comes into the temple, the rebuilt temple, and says, no more sacrifices. I am God. You worship me. And Jesus said, when that happens, you get out of the city. You flee the city because it's going to be hell on earth from that point on. He's given three and a half years to act. After he reveals his true color. See, you got to remember about the devil. He's a deceiver. So he never comes and shows you who he really is. He comes disguised. He disguises himself as an angel of light. So that you would believe him. If he ever showed his true colors and came at you the way he really is, you would back off and say, no way am I going to follow that. 
You know, if the devil had told Eve in the garden, hey, Eve, why don't you eat this fruit? Why don't you disobey God? Because if you do that, then I can wreck the world. I can cause your kids to kill each other. I can ruin your life and ruin your legacy. Well, who's going to, you're going to eat the fruit after he tells you that? That's the truth. But the only way the devil gets his work done is through lies. And so when the Antichrist comes on the scene, well, he rides a white horse. He looks like the hero. He looks like the guy that's uh, making everything good for everybody. Wow, this guy is great. And then he conquers death. Whoa. And then he sets himself up in the temple of God and says, I am God. You worship me. And the devil has a teammate. You know, the devil is a, he is a copycat. He knows that God is Trinity. He knows God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the three in one. And so the devil is a created being. God is the creator. So the devil tries to mimic God. And you have the devil, the, the serpent of old, the dragon. Revelation chapter two calls him, 12 calls him a dragon. He's the counterpart of God the Father. The Antichrist, the beast, he's the counterpart to God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, you have a third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. And the devil has a counterfeit Holy Spirit. He's called the false prophet. And the, the false prophet does what the Holy Spirit does because Jesus said of the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he shall glorify me. For he uh, shines the light on Jesus and points the way to Jesus. The false prophet points to the Antichrist, tells everybody to worship the Antichrist. The false prophet is going to set up an image in the temple, not of Zeus, but of the Antichrist. And he has power to make this image come to life. And there's breath in this image, and he begins to speak. And he says, if you don't worship the beast and his image, well, you're dead. We're going to kill you. You have to do that because the punishment of not doing it is death. And the way he does it is by making everyone get a mark of allegiance. We call that the mark of the beast. Revelation chapter 13 tells us about the mark of the beast. This is what the scripture says. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which was given him to perform in the presence of the beast. Talking about the he is the false prophet. Telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. And there was given him to give to breathe life to the image of the beast. And the image of the beast might even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And so then he makes everybody get a mark on your right hand or on your forehead. We're very familiar with that. Six, six, six. Actually, it's not three separate sixes, but it's 666. His name is going to total 666. We don't know who that is. He hasn't been revealed yet. He won't be revealed until after the rapture. But people will get the mark, which is the number of his name, 666. Some people have said, what's the significance about 666? Six is the number of man. Man was created on the sixth day. Three is the number of God, because God is Trinity. Holy, holy, holy. Holy is the Father. Holy is the Son. Holy is the Spirit. Six, the number of man. Three, the number of God. There are three sixes. Six, six, six. It is man sitting on the throne pretending to be God. And you have to get his mark. And if you don't get his mark, you know what? You can't buy and you can't sell and if you can't buy and you can't sell, you can't live. You can't live. How are you going to live if you can't buy or sell? And so here's what's going to happen to the people left behind. To, because there are a bunch of religious people that are going to be left behind. If the rapture came today, I guarantee you there would be churches in our city. They wouldn't have anybody gone. It'd just be, yeah, we're still here. Because they don't preach the gospel and they don't have people that have really given their hearts to Christ. And they have guys in their pulpit that are religious, but they're lost. I've talked to lots of guys who are, are pastors and you talk to them about their relationship with Jesus. And it is really fuzzy because they don't have a testimony to tell you about when they were born again. 
And so some of those places, they're going to still be going strong. Hey, well, wh where'd everybody go? Uh, that kind of thing. So those folks, when they're required to get the mark of the beast, they'll say to, the, to their folks, well, you know, I mean, hey, we got to be wise here because if you can't buy ourselves, God's given us a brain. And so we need to do this. We understand that, uh, you know, yeah, we got to pledge allegiance to the, to the beast, but we really know that that's not true. And so after all, a man's got to live. No, he doesn't. A man doesn't have to live. A man has to die and then stand before God. That's what a man has to do and give an account of his life. But these people are going to rationalize that. Let me give you a scripture that shows what happens. Perhaps you're going to be left behind and you're going to be in this situation where you're going to be confronted with getting the mark of the beast and worshiping the beast and his image. Let me give you a scripture. Revelation chapter 14 verses 9 and 10. This is the speech of an angel and he says this, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead or upon his hand, he also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb. You get the mark of the beast and you seal your fate forever in hell. That's what the scripture says. And so here is the Antichrist. He breaks his covenant. He makes everybody worship him. He says, I am God. And if you don't worship me, I will kill you. And you mark it down. He will murder people by the untold millions. Hitler killed an estimated 6 million Jews plus other people. Not just 6 million Jews. Somebody said he killed like 11 million people if you add in uh, the people that were all killed by the war. He was in, involved in the killing of 11 million people. I mean, he's probably, he's probably the worst of the worst. I mean, if you want to uh, tell somebody, hey, you're a terrible person, I mean, you can't get worse than Hitler unless you tell them they're the devil. The Antichrist is the devil in the flesh. He's the devil incarnate. He's evil incarnate. And he is going to mow people down by the millions. Revelation chapter 13 says this. And there was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies. And authority to act for 42 months was given to him. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle. That is those who dwell in heaven. And it was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. For three and a half years he's got... Carte blanche, he's in charge of all things. God allows him to do that. And he goes after believers to mow them down, to wipe them out. He hates God and he hates the people of God. The church is gone. It says that he goes after the saints. It doesn't say he goes after the church. The church has been raptured out. But what you have during the tribulation period, you have tribulation saints, those who put their faith and trust in Jesus, and he comes after them. And the fifth seal talks about the martyrs, and they're going to be martyrs by the millions that are killed by the Antichrist. So reminder number one, he's revealed after the rapture. Reminder number two, he's going to claim to be God and demand to be worshiped. Reminder number three, and this is the good news. He will be destroyed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Destroyed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 8. And then that lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. Here's how this works. You have the rapture take place. We're out of here. All those who know Christ. And then however long a period of time, whether it's a month, whether it's six months, whether it's a year, whether it's two years, we don't know. But this guy is going to rise up, this little horn, and he's going to sign a peace treaty with Israel. And he's going to protect Israel. And he's going to go out the bow with no arrows. And he's going to build this coalition. And he's going to get stronger and stronger. And then he's going to get shot. And he's going to look like he's dead and come back to life. And he sets himself up in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God, demanding everyone to worship. And then he is attacking everyone that stands in his way and every believer that stands in his way. And he is mowing them down by the millions. And during this time, God is pouring out his wrath on the world. It's awful. Jesus said, unless those days had been cut short, everyone would be dead. 
That's how bad it is. Seven billion people in the world. Everyone would be dead in a short period of time, in seven years. And so the Lord had to cut those days short. But you have God pouring out uh, seals of wrath and trumpets of wrath and bowls of wrath and the devil pouring out uh, his disdain and wrath and hatred toward the people of God. Well, here is how it all culminates. You have the devil, he gathers all the, the armies of all the world and he gathers them in a place called the Valley of Megiddo or Armageddon. I've been to that place. You see that field. It's farmland, and it just goes as far as the eye can see. That place one day is going to be filled with soldiers. And those soldiers have gathered there. That's the staging area. And then they're going to go up to attack and destroy Jerusalem, the holy city, destroy the Jews once and for all. Here's the reason why. God has made promises to the Jews. He, the Lord Jesus is the son of David, and he is going to come and rule and reign. And those promises are given to the Jews. If the Jews are wiped out, those promises can't come true. And if those promises can't come true, then God is a promise breaker. He's not a promise keeper. And God is unjust, and God is a liar. And the devil wins if the Lord can't fulfill his promise to the Jewish people. So the devil comes with all his armies to wipe out the Jewish people once and for all. And right at the ninth hour, at the uh, last moment, here comes Jehovah Nicka time, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he comes to set his feet on the Mount of Olives. He's riding a white horse and he's got fire in his eyes. And in righteousness, he judges and wages war. And he's got an army with him, his church, dressed in fine linen, white and clean. And we come with him riding on white horses. We don't do any of the fighting. He does all the fighting. But he has a sharp sword that goes out of his mouth. And he slays the Antichrist with the breath of his mouth. And the Bible says in Revelation chapter 19, And I saw the beast... And the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat upon the horse and against his army. And the beast was seized. And with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. And these two were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword which came from his mouth, the mouth of him who sat upon the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. And the Bible says in Revelation chapter 14 that the carnage is so great. See, Jesus is the one who treads the wine press of the fierce wrath of God. You've seen people in a wine press and they're stomping on the grapes and the juice is coming out. That's what Jesus does with his enemies. And the carnage is so great. The Bible says that the blood comes up to the horse's bridles for a distance of 200 miles. It's a river of blood as he stomps out his enemies. He is king of kings yes. and lord of lords. Yes. And the Antichrist will be defeated by the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. So, in closing, here's the question. What about those who miss the rapture? Hey, you're, you're here and you haven't made a decision for Christ. If the rapture came right now, you'd be left behind. What about those who are left behind? Well, let me tell you two things about those who are left behind because the Bible t indicates this in the book of the Revelation. You're gonna have millions and millions and millions of people get saved during the tribulation period. A lot of Jews are gonna get saved. Bible says there are 12,000 from every tribe that'll get saved, 144,000 Jews that are going to be out there evangelizing during the tribulation period. God sends two witnesses, Revelation chapter 11, come from heaven to evangelize. We don't know who they are. Some say it's Moses and Elijah that comes back because Moses was the one that stood up to Pharaoh and Moses was the one that, that God used to perform many miracles. And uh, Moses symbolizes the law. Elijah symbolizes the prophets. They say, well, it's Moses and Elijah that come back. Others say, well, it's, it's Enoch who never died. He was raptured out and Elijah because neither one of those guys ever died. We don't know who the two witnesses are, but these two witnesses are big time. 
and they're going to be preaching the truth and calling men to repentance, and those who don't want to repent aren't going to want to hear it, and they're going to want to silence these two witnesses. But if anyone tries to harm them, the Bible says fire comes out of their mouth and consumes them. You can't shut these guys up. Eventually, the Antichrist is able to overcome them, and they die, and they let their bodies just hang out in the street. And people are rejoicing, and they're giving gifts to one another. It's like Christmas time because they said, we hated these two witnesses because they were calling us out. They were saying that we were sinners. They were saying that we were going to be judged by God. And while the cameras are on them, all of a sudden, after three days, God brings life back into these two guys, and they come up out of the, the earth, and God raptures them to heaven, and the Bible says great fear fell upon all those who saw these things. Great fear, because this is what you saw, right? And so God uses those guys to bring many to faith in Christ. But here's the thing. While millions come to faith in Christ, especially the Jews, those who heard before the rapture, and didn't respond, they're going to believe the lie. Look at verse 9, and I'm just about to land the plane. It says, that is the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish. To perish means you die and go to hell. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. For those who perish, why do they perish? Because they did not receive the love of the truth, so as to be saved. They heard the gospel, and they didn't respond to the gospel. They rejected the gospel. They ignored the gospel. Verse 11, and for this reason, because they didn't respond to the love of the truth, so as to be saved, God will send upon them a deluding influence. Whoa, this is God. God's supposed to be drawing us to himself, but now God is deluding, uh, sending a deluding influence so that they might believe what is false. God is getting people to believe what is false. That doesn't sound like God. In order that they all may be judged. Why would God want anybody to be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness? Hey, you mark it down. When someone is confronted with the gospel, You'll hear people say, well, you know, I can't believe that I have intellectual problems. Bull. You don't have intellectual problems. What you have is a sin problem. You have a moral problem. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. He doesn't say that in his head. He says that in his heart. He says no to God in his heart. Jesus said, men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds are evil. And Jesus, the light of the world, he comes into the world. And what are the men are like roaches. They run when the light comes because they don't want their deeds exposed. They don't come to the light because they love their sin. They love their wickedness. And when they're presented with the truth, they say, well, uh, let's, if I give my life to Jesus, then, well, and I can't. I can't keep committing adultery. I can't keep committing fornication. I can't keep uh, drinking myself silly every night. I can't keep doing this sin or that sin or cheating in business or whatever it might be. They love their sin. I can't have money as my idol. And so I have a choice. I, I choose Jesus or I choose my sin. And you say, well, that would be stupid. Everybody would choose Jesus. No, they don't. They take pleasure in wickedness. And many people, Choose their sin over God's son. And when you do that, God says, all right, you made your decision. I gave you my truth, and you rejected my truth. So you're not going to have my truth and your sin. I'm going to take my truth away. And you're going to have your sin, and then not only am I taking my truth away, but I'm going to push you in the area, in the error uh, direction of lies. And you're going to believe the lie, and you're going to think the Antichrist is the Christ, and you're going to believe the lie, and you're going to be damned along with him. Why? Because when I sent my son, and he died on the cross for your sins, and you heard the message of the greatest love of all, that God would send his son for you, and you rejected that, all that's left for you is judgment. God loves his son. God the Father saw his son brutalized beyond anything our minds can imagine for you and for me, and for us to reject that, you're going to experience the judgment and the wrath of God. That's not what God wants. 
God wants people to come to him. And you have time now. If you're here today and you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, maybe you're thinking in your mind, you know, if, if the rapture does hit, that's when I'm going to get saved. Don't be so sure. You have an opportunity right now to trust Jesus if you've never done so. And listen, as Christians, we have an opportunity right now to get right with God because many of us have allowed compromise to come into our hearts and we're not on fire for the Lord like he wants us to be and we're not witnessing and we're not praying. And I'm speaking to myself because it's easy. uh, The longer you live as a Christian, it's easy to cool off. And this is an opportunity for us to get on fire again for the Lord. Repent, therefore, and return so that your sins may be forgiven in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. My friend, the Lord is coming soon. And the big question is this, are you ready? If you're not, today is the day to get ready. Just pray this simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself but I believe that you are God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and you rose again from the dead. And right now, Jesus, I open my heart to you. Come into my life, forgive me of all my sins, be my Lord and Savior. I surrender my all to you. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I would love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as your personal Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God and you're important to us and we're here for you. Thank you for watching From His Heart, the viewer-supported broadcast outreach of Dr. Jeff Shreve who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Find out more. Go to fromhisheart.org.